Greetings and welcome to a new episode of the Cosmopolitan Shipwrecks. Our guest is Dr. Rituparna Roy. Dr. Roy is an academic and creative writer based in Kolkata, an alumna of Presidency College and Calcutta University. On this episode, we will be discussing the role of art and literature in alleviating the impacts of partition and discover the, the Kolkata Partition Museum that was founded in 2018. We will be also discussing uh, shortly the, the, the 1947 partition and its precondition as well as its psychological impacts. So I would like to welcome Arturo Di Simone and Dr. Rotopana Roy to, to our conversation. So first, thanks uh, Dr. Roy for joining us and we're happy to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. Cool. Um, so let's, let's start. Thank you. Would, thank you. We, we, first, we'd like to start by asking you right, if you can give us a glimpse on your research work and your current projects. Um, yeah, so uh, let me just start off by saying that I am, uh, basically, I have a background of English literature. I studied English literature at Kolkata in Presidency and Calcutta University, as you said. My BA, MA, PhD was under, under Calcutta University. And uh, uh, in my master's, I had a, a specialization. I needed to take a specialization, which I did uh, Indian writing in English. And that is when I uh, realized that, you know, a lot of the history that I had read uh, during school uh, about India's independence, uh, fight, struggle for independence was very income. It gave me a very incomplete story. It just told me about the struggle for independence and it stopped there. Uh, whereas what literature did was it introduced me to partition, which was the twin of independence in 1947. Because I saw that a lot of the Indian English novels, uh, major novels, uh, dealt with partition and they, they did it very differently. So I was very intrigued. So when I landed a fellowship, a UGC fellowship, uh, soon after, I knew what to work on. So in my doctoral work, I dealt with uh, partition fiction in English which I did in India. And I also started my teaching career here in Kolkata. I taught at an undergraduate college for several years. And then I relocated to Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And there I did a independent postdoctoral project uh, at a research institute at Leiden, International Institute of Asian Studies. And there I researched partition literature in Bangla, specifically from West Bengal. Um, and what happened is, you know, I was always interested in museums, but uh, I, I lived in uh, uh, the Netherlands for about 10 years. And one of the great advantages, delights of uh, living and traveling in Europe for me was being able to see a lot of museums. I absolutely gorged on them. And it was in one of those museum visits that uh, the idea of the Partition Museum first came to me. It was in way back in 2007, we had gone to Berlin for just a very short visit and uh, on a weekend and we had time enough only for a walking tour, you know, those famous Berlin walks. And we picked a historical tour of four hours. And as you know, in this historical tours, what happened is you are shown the, you know, major points uh, in the city and their history. And in certain places you're allowed to stop. So one of the stops was the Holocaust, Open Holocaust Memorial uh, um, designed by Peter Eisenman, which is also called Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe. And I remember it was a very bright October day, but uh, walking randomly through that stele, I just sat down at one point and for the first time, I think I, uh, I was struck by the enormity of the crime against the Jews. Like I'd read books, seen films, but you know, the, what, the, the way that that, uh, that installation or architecture, whatever you call it, that affected me uh, was completely different. And there's another thought that struck me. It was 2007. It was the 60th year of uh, uh, Indian independence and partition. And I just left India and gone uh, to the Netherlands. And I, I knew that a lot of seminars, since I'm an academic, I knew that a lot of seminars and uh, uh, conferences would happen in India relating to that. I see in what happens in India when 15th August happens, the status thing is that you celebrate independence in a very major way, right? But you don't commemorate partition really that way, except for in, in these conferences, what I'm talking of 10, 15 years later. Now it has changed a bit. Uh, so I just thought that, you know, why on earth don't be, and I knew that all that will happen after those conferences will be conference volumes which partition scholars will read and use in their research. 
So I just felt, why you are not, do we not have such a public memorialization of partition? Because you see the Holocaust and partition happened more or less in the same time. So the final solution was really like 43 to 45, right? And uh, the partition happened in 1947. So it's actually around the same time. Mm. And I just felt, why, why didn't we have anything like that? So we have a lot of history writing, we have literature, we have films, but why not public memorization? So it was just a thought. I didn't know much about it. I was very preoccupied with my personal life. I continued with my research. But it was in 2016 that I started thinking very concretely about it. And you know, there were two things I wanted to do while I was thinking of uh, this project. One of the first things I wanted to do as a kind of homework was I wanted to visit other partitioned countries. So India is not the only one to have been partitioned, right? So, uh, and I've not come across too many comparative histories, you know? Uh, I felt this was one major lacuna in partition studies, I mean, in my understanding. And since I was placed in Europe, I thought that I will visit like the three places that I first thought of was Germany, Yugoslavia, Ireland. And uh, what I was thinking of is basically I wanted to visit their museums and uh, most of them don't have partition museums, of course, like, you know, basically they're museums where they memorialize that, that division mm -hmm. and try and understand the specific memorialization practices involved in the making of this museum so that I could gain insights uh, from them. Uh, so I could actually manage only Berlin, which was closest to me. I was in Amsterdam then. And I went on a self-sponsored study trip to Berlin for three and a half, four days. And I spent an entire day at Sachsenhausen, just outside of Berlin, which was the first concentration camp, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, Jewish Mem uh, Museum Berlin, which was, which, you know, which was my chief inspiration, you could say, also uh, topography of terror. And once again, the Holocaust Memorial. And that was a turning point in my life, those three days, you know, mm -hmm. because if 2007 was the first moment of inspiration, mm -hmm. 2016 motivated me in a wholly different way to mm -hmm. pursue this project. I wrote a very longish report on it uh, in one of uh, the most well-known uh, online portals from India, The Wire, and it was published on 15th August 2016. And uh, but I'll tell you about uh, you know I was uh, I will tell you about the major takeaways from that which which inspired me to do uh, this, which is that uh, one was that they were all citizen initiatives. All these were basically citizen initiatives after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And uh, citizens took a very proactive part. They just did not initiate. They were part of the entire process, you know. So that was really eye-opening. The wow. history of the making of those museums itself was very interesting. The second was I felt... Uh, uh, a question, yeah. Dr. Roy. Uh, so how did... Uh, I remember reading how Gandhi and Ambedkar were two very prominent figures in Indian independence. They mm -hmm. also were very interested in a comparison of the history of the Jewish question in Europe during the war to certain mm -hmm. things happening in India. Uh, Gandhi mm -hmm. mentioned uh, the Jewish people and Ambedkar much more directly or much more instinctively identified he mm. the leader of the untouchable movements, not mm. the conflict with Gandhi because of that, he more mm. directly uh, related mm. to the uh, plights of the Jewish people. Um, mm. did, did this mm. have any any resonance with you or? Actually, actually, no, Arturo. Uh, the thing is, you know, I uh, Ambit, Ambit, Ambitkar's interest in the Jewish question would be very understandable because you see, it is basically about persecuted races and persecuted minorities. You see, and he came from uh, a section of uh, you know the population. A caste system, as you know, is very rigid, and it was very rigid then. And so he he had to fight it all his life. Uh, so the question of persecution and uh, uh, being, uh, being being a persecuted minority, however different uh, in different places of the world. So that had a great resonance with him. When I visited Berlin and it affected me, I was really like, Gandhi Ambedkar was really not on my mind. What was, was, you know, those, uh, since I was specifically thinking of a museum to commemorate partition, 
Okay, uh, uh, Gandhi died very soon after partition. Amitkar obviously was uh, the fa father of a constitution. Our constitution happened because of him. He was uh, he was the main framer of uh, you know the main chief figure in the constituent assembly. Uh, but the thing is, when I was in Berlin, I was I did not have the ghost of Ambedkar or Gandhi in my mind. To be very honest, what I did was I mean the takeaway for me was that how the past can be remembered. And I just felt that the Germans, especially, you know, I saw that it was being remembered from two perspectives, both from the side of the victims and the perpetrators. So if Jewish Memorial Ber Museum Berlin was really from the perspective of, of the victims, the topography of terror is really from the perspective of the perpetrators, which I found absolutely uh, mind blowing. You know, there were certain features I really liked about those museums. I'm not getting into the year of it. Uh, uh, just one, maybe just one. So topography of terror, basically what it does is apart from its main museum, what you do is, you know, you enter it from two kind of staircases down and there is an open exhibition, a glass exhibition of basically the terror years, 1933 uh, to 45, how the Nazi terror unfolded, the role of the SS. There is a blow by blow, year by year account in uh, in that open, open air exhibition, you know? So what they are trying to do, and just see, just think of the, uh, the vision or the uh, mentality that went into making that. So basically you can be anything, you can be a, you can just be a citizen of Berlin, you can be a foreign tourist, you can be somebody interested in history, you can even be a school child just walking past. You just get interested in walk down and that terrible history is made available and accessible to you, just like that. My, you know, it's a museum, it's not, it's, it's not like, uh, it's not like, uh, inside a building and you enter and you it's it's not uh, it's not uh, what should i say uh, what is that called M mummified it is made a part of almost everyday reality so it is it is made that accessible in fact that casual in a way so i just thought that that was great to be able to give that kind of access to citizens to outsiders to everybody and to say that you know this is our past it was shameful this is what we did so I feel that it is also, I mean, those who are uh, engaged in trauma studies, they we obviously know this, that, uh, you know, acknowledging the past, people who have an inheritance of pain, mm -hmm. acknowledging a shameful past is actually the first step towards healing. And yet, I mean, yeah. and yet you, you have told us previously that in, in your museum, which makes to my mind, makes it different from a museum like the Israeli Holocaust Museum Yad Vashem, which I visited as a, also as a grandson of victims of the Holocaust. Uh, your museum seems to also surpass merely the, the, the clinical understanding of trauma, shame, guilt, and it's more about a creative uh, exploration of what is part yes. and what what survived what lessons are to be right taught. right and, 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 uh, of arts and, and music in your museum mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, Arturo, uh, you are right uh, but if i can first correct you and muhammad a little bit the kolkata partition museum project which i've initiated in 2016 and uh, uh, which is here headed by a trust which is uh, like as an organization, we are two years old in 2018. It's still a you know project in the making. The museum hasn't happened. It is a citizen initiative. It will take a while. So it is really a, still a project. And uh, if I may just just finish what I was saying because that will help me answer your question better. Uh, but one of the last takeaways of uh, the Berlin experience for me uh, was that I re I felt and this was a very subjective response. But I felt that, you know, the things that I liked most about those museums were architectural features and installations. So I just felt that architecture, installation, art, basically, you know, in a very extended sense, uh, they, uh, it was perhaps uh, uh, better equipped to convey the unspeakable than literature. So see, I have been a literary studies scholar throughout. And I believe in the power of literature. I still do. But there I just felt for, for memorializing something like this. You know, it was a very unnerving moment for me because I've always believed in the power of literature. And here was I for the first time. I felt it was inadequate. To some extent, I mean, producing affect, you know. 
so but basically what it uh, what it brought home to me was the power of art so when you meet when you're commemorating something like this what art the role that art can play so which is why you know i said this in order to answer your question which is uh, so our museum which is you know it is a project in the making as i said we just two years old the trust which is pure heading uh, this particular project we are just two years old we've had a number of uh, events in the last two years and uh, you know we have three main aims uh, in in um, doing this museum number one is that we want to we want to memorialize in the most comprehensive manner the history of partition relating to bengal so you know kolkata partition museum uh, project aims at establishing a partition museum in kolkata focusing on the experience of bengal so when partition happened in 1947 the two main provinces which were divided really were on the western and eastern side of india one was punjab one was bengal so and they were like uh, the new state that was created pakistan in a very peculiar way it was it had two wings west pakistan east pakistan and they were separated by 1000 miles so the history of pa indian punjab uh, after partition the way they experienced the partition and its aftermath was very different from the way bengal experienced it and the bengal story i mean i can go on about that later probably in a different question because that that, that will take a lot of time very uh, it's Uh, it it is a very different experience so uh, can i can i just say two points about it can i just say can I touch on yes yeah. sure yeah. yeah so so the thing is uh, so in punjab what happened it was a one time event marked by a two way exodus so muslims went out hindus came in there was an almost equal exchange of population number 2 which is probably number 1 is the violence the unprecedented violence the genocidal violence in punjab so since it was unprecedented and you know the the government also you know it it responded in a war footing and that also to the crisis in punjab and that also translated in very uh, uh, you know uh, effective measures for refugee rehabilitation in the punjab you know and uh, the border was very strict it still is for very strategic purposes because it is the inter pakistan border now things in bengal were very different so the and in bengal in 1947 i am emphasizing 47 because you know uh, uh, bengal the partition story in bengal started much before 47 it started in 46 so in 47 the violence was compared to punjab it was less and the migration was one way primarily one way from east to west bengal and it actually it had a porous border it still has and at the border actually the uh, migration of refugees the migration of people it was not just a 1947 story it happened time and again in 1950 1964 in a very major way in 1971 when bangladesh was formed and it continues sometimes in trickle sometimes in flood so you know bengal was impoverished by partition it radicalized the politics and it faced a decades long refugee crisis even as the border remained porous and that is one of the reasons why you know the major political upheaval that we have have had in the last one year is also tracing back to this illegal migrants from bangladesh led to the citizenship amendment act so you know this is so a bengal story is a very different story and another important thing and mostly it is has to do with migration and the way it was tackled so in bengal initially in the last for, uh, in 1947 the migration was only about 1 million in in the next 7 8 years that shot up to 3.5 million so it was a crisis that just the state of province of west bengal was not you know it did not have the wherewithal to tackle it so what happened in the initial phase when refugees were coming in they were resettled within the state of west bengal mm -hmm. but after a point they were resettled outside of the state in actually disparate parts of the continent in yes. assam in the east in madhya pradesh in the in the middle in andaman and nicobar island in the south so you see it was a very different trajectory and uh, very few people know about this just As for late... i'm sorry uh, excuse me uh, uh, we can find just for our viewers uh, 
the Citizenship Amendment Act, they might not be entirely familiar with this. Right, 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 right. right, right. To a sort of a sort of nation state law snuck yeah. in behind yeah. the reform on immigration, yeah. which really basically allows non-Muslim immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. here it was quite recent. Mm -hmm. This act mm -hmm. 2017, or no, 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 if, I, if I can also add on Arturo's question, how much does the historical caste structure is still feeding this this the, the new laws that have been passed recently? Like, how much does the, the structure that certain groups trying to maintain? Their, their power, their uh, If I may answer your question, one, uh, actually, Mohammed, your voice was not very clear, uh -huh. but I got okay. your question. Okay. Uh, I will answer, they are very different questions, actually. Okay. Okay. Uh, citizenship Amendment Act has nothing to do with caste, it has to do with religion. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'll first answer Arturo's question. Yes, so you have asked two very different questions. I was just saying what Arturo was referring to uh, in relation to what I was saying is that a lot of our present troubles are a long-term consequence of partition, the long shadow of partition. Mm -hmm. So uh, to give a background of the Citizenship Amendment Act, actually there, there was an originary Citizenship Act in 1955. And over the last six, seven decades, it went through two amendments. One was in 2003, and the latest is in 2019, when it became a, a, another act. So in 2013, there was the first amendment, which was basically, see, uh, Citizenship Act is obviously to deal with citizenship. It introduced in 2003, uh, something called the National Register of Citizens was introduced, which, meant, which basically meant was documenting citizens uh, who is legal and who is illegal. The point was the illegal ones will be identified and deported. Now that was implemented in the state of Assam in the Northeast in 2013-14, but not in the rest of India. Last year, the BJP government decided that they are going to implement that all over India. Okay. And then what they did was they amended the act in December 2019. And what they said was this is they are creating a path for providing citizenship to illegal migrants mm -hmm. from neighboring countries. But there were two qualifiers. The neighboring countries that they, uh, the illegal, uh, were from where illegal immigrants came to flee persecution, those three countries mentioned are Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. And the other qualifier, which is the more important one, is that for the first time, religion was made a criteria. So they said, we are going to give legal citizenship to illegal migrants from certain religions. And they mentioned Hindu, Sikh, Parsi, Christian, Jain, Buddhist. They left out Muslims. They didn't say we are not going to give it to Muslims. They just left out Muslims in the definition. Sorry, um, it's, it's... can I please can I please complete oh, yeah. this? Can I please complete yeah. this? So for the first time, religion was made a criteria for citizenship in Indian law, mm -hmm. and of course, this was uh, widely protested against because this is discriminatory, and it was the protests happened for various different reasons. For example, in Assam, the protest was happening because Assam has a history of anti-Bengali sentiment. Because you know Bengalis have gone, and th th there is a, there is a contention between Assamese and Bengalis. There's a long history to that. So Assam felt that if illegal migrants from Bangladesh came over, more Hindu illegal migrants came over, they didn't want that. They didn't want more of Hindu Bangladeshis to come into Assam. So they they were they were protesting against that. The rest of India was protesting for Muslims. They were saying that Muslims should also be included. So there was a nationwide protest and uh, actually uh, uh, students, uh, there was a lot of uh, student protests in universities, uh, Aligarh Muslim University, Jamia Millia, uh, JNU, uh, a lot of them in Delhi, one in Aligarh. And uh, uh, police really clamped down on them. We, we saw a lot of violence and protests uh, regarding that. Intellectuals, social activists, uh, 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 student activists were arrested not granted bail, some are still in prison. So basically the point is, is about migration. 
and that migration is related to the eastern side of Bengal because a ma maximum amount of illegal migrants in India is supposed to be from Bangladesh. Uh -huh. So what I was trying to say is that our aim is one, to memorialize our specific history. Bengal's partition history is very different from Punjab. Very few people know this partition history. So it is very important that we remember, we remember it for future generations. We remember it for, our, for the rest of the world to understand and to know. The second point is related to a discourse of nationalism in a very in, indirect way, you could say. Because we, what we want to do is we want to change the discourse of partition. Whenever we think of partition, we think of rupture, violence, dislocation, disruption. And it is, uh, it is understandable because rupture was the defining characteristic of the event. But it, and it has been documented very well, you know, in history writing, in uh, films, literature. But there are certain quiet continuities, if I may say so, in Bengali life also, which have not got adequate attention. For example, language, literature, food, fabric, uh, the performative arts, taken together, they are no mean thing, you know. Uh, uh, they are part, so we have a common living heritage, what is called living heritage. And that we still have a lot in common there that goes beyond the current nationalist rhetoric the current nationalist ideology, you know. Uh, so one of our aims is also to emphasize this. But on the one hand, while we will remember the partition and its aftermath, we also want to emphasize this other part, which has more to do with art and culture, mm -hmm. lived heritage culture. And we want to collaborate with Bangladesh on that. And the third is we want to involve public participation. And we've already actually implemented some of these in our events in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, how... Oh. Uh, yes, sir. And how, how can you try to keep these memories and try to use them to move forward, but not to stay in the past, try to bring the past to the future by romanticizing that the past was good, so that in a, in a way to accept the present and to try to move forward by creating an exclusive uh, environment? Yeah, so, so you see, uh, just emphasizing these uh, aspects of our living heritage, which actually, you know, we don't think about it's already Let me give you some examples, then you will understand. Uh, um, so, you know, uh, let's let's talk of fabric. I, I had thought of wearing a Bengal cotton and so, so like, like show you. So the 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 national dress that with the our dress are uh, is basically sari dhuti panjabi, right? Dhuti panjabi for men, sari for women. So there is this, we have the Bengal cotton, of course, but there are several weaves. Obviously, in every state of India, in, in South Asia, every little place has its own weave of cotton mm -hmm. and silk, etc. So uh, um, there is a particular weave called Dhakai, which originates from Dhaka, from the city of Dhaka. It's also uh, it's also a particular cloth, muslin, but it's also it also happens in cotton. The main thing is the weave. Okay. So that is a very prized possession in a Bengali woman's wardrobe. You know, I have, uh, my mother had the Dhakai Shari, 40 years old. I had worn it uh, in an interview just two months back because it has wonderful memories for me. And for me, wearing that sari was like wrapping my mother around me. Wearing that sari was like uh, revisiting childhood memories. Uh, and I always wear it on special occasions. So every woman, whether in East or West Bengal, would have something like that. I have several of them. Mm -hmm. So so this is, this is one. We don't even need to like make it a point we actually do it in our lives we had this very famous uh, popular folk singer songwriter uh, scholar his name was kalika prashad who recently died uh, uh, very suddenly in an accident two three years back and he was uh, the lead of a of a band called dohar so when he suddenly died you know people from both sides of bengal mourned equally there is a there is a singer called Moshami Bhoumi who uh, archives the folk songs of Bengal from both sides. And she's been doing that like for I don't know 10, 12 years. She has this wonderful website called Traveling Archive. She actually does field recordings of of folk singers, you know, uh, which is our common heritage. Uh, you know, when people on the border villages of Bangladesh uh, they have uh, medical emergencies, they actually cross over to Taki on this side, which is on the border, 
to get medical uh, ye help because what happens is they may not get that in bangladesh uh, another example i'll give you uh, we have a lot of aya centers in kolkata in kolkata you know for the last after liberalization what has happened uh, youngsters leave kolkata by droves and they don't come back so effectively it's a huge old age home you know and a lot of elderly people stay alone so they are looked after by ayas from aya center some stay for 12 hours some stay for 24 hours a lot of these ayas are actually bangladeshi women who had come long ago somewhere illegal now they are legal they have their passport they have their aadhar card etc and another very so you know these are things in which these things bind us these things are common to us even without thinking we live this common reality another very very big thing this year it struck us like a blow you know we had this cyclone called amphan in may so we had this double whammy while india was fighting with covid we were fighting with covid and amphan so uh, 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 this area is very prone to cyclones and this is not the first time as you know everywhere these incidents are increasing so when you have an aina or amphan it affects bangladesh and west bengal equally they were both devastated the coastal areas were both devastated so even ecology in terms of ecology we have a you know we have a common ecology we are a deltaic people so uh, you know we we need to remember this and that is what we are trying to do it's, it's very interesting a uh, uh, little karma so uh, I, I had some questions about literature. I remember once you mentioning, of course, we're going to ask you about your own short story collection, but also in your study of it has nothing to do with partition. My work has nothing to do with partition. Yeah, understood. But in your English uh, language partition literature study, you mm. mentioned Babsi Sidwa's book. I study man. Mm-hmm. I study man, which is strangely mm-hmm. translated with often a much boring title, much more boring title, "Cracking India," by far yeah. from I study man, and mm-hmm. so of, um, a Zoroastrian child from the Zoroastrian or the Parsi minority growing up, mm-hmm. this fracturing mm-hmm. India, and mm-hmm. I, I find that um, very interesting, and also uh, I'm curious as to what. that book and how you intend to bring such works of literature to a broad public also the works of rabindranath tagore perhaps who is slightly he has a certain reputation of having been an aristocratic writer yet i i recently saw a very marvelous adaptation of rabindranath, rabindranath tagore the nobel prize winning bengali poet uh, novel by satya satyajit ray which is Come a very Yes, uh, the the title oh, briefly, right. I think so. A, a very self-critical post-colonial story about a young aristocratic nationalist who does some, the world, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, does some harm to his own people by promoting nationalism and creating a conflict between Hindus mm-hmm. and Muslims for the mm-hmm. purpose of a nationalist. self esteem against the british and yet mm-hmm. towards the very end of this beautiful film by such mm-hmm. a chief ray based on tagore's mm-hmm. novel we, we see how these working class fishermen are disserviced by this, this nationalism and we also see a little glimpse in the more pessimistic character of this love triangle between the the idealistic terrorist or, or rebel and and someone who's a little bit more close to the close to the earth craft with a more rebellious mm-hmm. a glimpse mm-hmm. of what's coming as if Tagore saw these terrible uh contract conflicts emerging around partition mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. how do you how do you bring such works of literature like ice candy man which is a very touching novel or satyajit ray mm-hmm. or other works that probably many more we don't know about uh that that, that delve into many topics that remain taboo in India today hmm. what, what are your thoughts i i will deal with tagore first and then come to babsi sidwa if you if i may yes please um, yes so with the novel you are referring to is ghare uh, baire uh, translated as home at the world uh, which shotujit ray it was uh, uh, It, it it is a novel with a backdrop of the 
first partition of Bengal and the Shadeshi movement. And uh, I'll, I'll just say in brief what that was, and which Shatujit Rai had, uh, which Ray, I mean, he's considered, he's usually pronounced as Ray. Uh, Ray had uh, adapted uh, in, in 1984, and it has a love triangle. Shundip, who is the Shadeshi revolutionary, Nikhilesh, who is the aristocrat, a uh, very uh, deep delving uh, thinking man, and Bimala, his wife, who gets attracted to his friend. Um, so what happened is, see, Bengal was partitioned thrice. The first partition happened in 1905, and it was uh, annulled in 1911. Uh, there were there were protests; people didn't accept. And after six years, it was annulled, and uh, that is when Cal Kolkata, Calcutta, then had ceased to be the capital of the British Empire in India. Uh, now the thing is, uh, the you know Tagore was a very unique man. So people in the West know him to be the poet for whom who, who was the first Asian to win the. Uh, Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913 for Gitanjali. Now, Gitanjali is really the tip of the iceberg. It was just song offerings, uh, uh, yet liked it, etc. But he uh, he was a uh, uh, he he was a, he was one of he was and still is one of our greats as far as literature is concerned. There's not a single genre that they, he didn't write about. So, novel, short story, poem. And he was also a composer, you know. Uh, let me just, this is a little aside, but you know, Tagore is primarily now remembered for his songs. He wrote he wrote like 2,000 songs and composed and uh, set them to music. We call it Robindo Shong. It's a different genre and music altogether. And uh, we actually, he's mostly remembered now for his songs. His literature is, of course, so he not only wrote, he was an educationist, he was a social reformer. He was a patriot and a cosmopolitan. He was not a nationalist. So I'll give you examples of his patriotism and nationalism first, and then I'll come to Ghori Bade. Then you will know. I'll come later. I'll talk of later things first, and then I'll come to that. So he uh, he got the uh, Nobel Prize in 1913, and he also was uh, he also lived in the knighthood in 1915, soon after the Nobel. But you know he rejected. He returned the knighthood in 1919 as as a mark of protest against the Jali and Malabar massacre. So there was a small group of people who were protesting against a very vicious act called the Rahul attack in Amritsar, Jali and Malabar, where the museum is right now, very close. Uh, and uh, 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 General Dyer had come and shot on unarmed people. And he sorry. had... Sorry? I'm sorry, who perpetrated the massacre? Uh, the, there was this uh, this British uh, ye called uh, General Dyer who came and, uh, yes. So what happened was, uh, uh, and they were peacefully protesting and they had no idea that they would be shot, you know? So it was on an unarmed, uh, yeah, on Baisakhi, which is the Punjabi New Year. So Tagore, what he did was he relinquished his knighthood. He said, you know, when my countrymen are treated with such ignominy, when their lives don't matter, I do not want to be honored. I'll give you another example. In 1917, talking of nationalism, the thing that first, the most important thing to remember about Tagore is a, a slim volume of essays called Nationalism. In 1917, during the First World War, uh, when India, you know, India was part of uh, the war effort, etc., uh, Tagore was had traveled to Japan and the U.S. and uh, the lectures were collected in a book of slim volume of essays called Nationalism. And imagine at the height of the anti-colonial movement in India, he said nationalism is a menace. And Mission. why is a menace mm -hmm. uh, that one should not worship nationalism? Why? And he was very much against xenophobia. Why? He said that the concept of nationalism is a very exclusivist one, is a very narrow one that ultimately detracts from humanity and the goals of humanity and the goals of nationalism are not the same. Now to say this in 1917 in India, I can't tell you how, how much courage one needed to do this. Uh, so he is very unique that way. So the same thing, uh, this is, these are later examples. So he was always this, you know, this celebration, this military celebration of a nation of saying that we are the best you are you are lesser than us. You know that is something he uh, he opposed, desisted, resisted all his life, and he did everything he could 
to uh, he was the ultimate cosmopolitan so you know the educationist figure so he built this uh, this uh, School, Pata Bhavan, in Chandigarh, 1901. Bishwa Bharati, the university was formed in 1921. Bishwa Bharati basically means you know, basically the communion of the world with India. It still exists. Okay. It still exists. It still exists. Yeah. And even as he was doing that, people know about Bishwa Bharati they, in Chandigarh Kitan. They don't know a uh, Institute of Rural Reconstruction in Srinagar Kitan, very close by, which was his way of re-energizing uh, rural economy. Uh, people know about Gandhi's efforts, but you know uh, he also did a lot. He sent his son to the U.S. to get trained and come back. In his uh, in his university, a lot of foreign scholars came to teach to study. So he's a very cosmopolitan outlook. Coming to nationalism in 1905, what happened is there were you know uh, ostensible reason for dividing Bengal was administrative. The British said it's too large; it has to be divided. But the real reason was that you know the nationalist uh, sentiments had been kindled in Bengal, and uh, if Bengal could be divided, then the British could kind of curb that. That was the real reason, basically. And uh, there were massive protests; people did not accept. But he had a very uh, unique way of protesting. So he said he was a poet. So he wrote songs. You know, in his in his song and the two thousand songs that roughly I was talking about, there are several categories in it. So there is nature, there is love, there is devotion. Often love and devotion coalesce. There is also a category called Shodeshi songs, which is they are they are basically translates as nationalist songs, but it is not nationalism in the narrow sense. They are more patriotic songs. Okay, so he was a poet, so he protested through songs. And he said the day of partition, the official day of partition, 16th October 1905. He said we will do a raksha bandhan. Raksha bandhan is uh, you, in our culture, you know, it's a band that a, a brother ties, a sister ties in a brother's hand, and basically that you protect me. It's a kind of a very sacred year between them. So he extended that. Uh, the meaning of that by saying Hindus and Muslims will tie ra rakis in each other's wrists. So it's a kind of thread that. Uh, pledges solidarity and love and friendship. So you know he he had these kind of ideas. Talking specifically of home and the world, what he was trying to say, you know, uh, partition the uh, Bengal partition changed the direction of Indian nationalism because one of the things they did, two things happened after the partition. Two strategies were evolved. One was called Swadeshi, the other was called boycott. So boycott was boycotting of British goods, you know. Soaps, dresses, anything, anything to do with England. So basically, you boycott British goods. And they were linked up, of course. And Shodeshi is pride in one's identity. So why we boycott British goods? We manufacture our own stuff. Now, while this was all very good and idealistic at at a very economical level, it actually affected adversely the traders and farmers because, especially in terms of cloth and soap and these things, you know what was produced, uh, the indigenous products that were produced. Number one, my coarser material was bad; they were far more expensive also. So, actually, it economically it uh, it was adverse for a lot of people, lower down uh, the economic strata. And it is in Whom and the World, uh, Tagore dramatizes this. So there is a very, very attractive Shadeshi leader, Shondi, who, you know, he's a demagogue, really. So he uh, he gives great speeches. Uh, women get attracted to him, and he also actually uses certain compromising means. He's he's also megalomaniac, you know. We get to know that later. But it's Nikhilesh who does not support Shadeshi. Uh, he is a very, very benign landlord. You know the um, the well-being of his subjects is uppermost in his mind, and he just feels that this shodishi, uh, what to say, this uh, uh, upsurge, is actually not benefiting his subjects. And he is very liberal. He allows his wife to get introduced to the. Uh, friend, he actually there's this thing called Andor Mall and Bar Bai Mall. So the the women spend time inside the house. And there's this beautiful scene in the film. You've seen it that Bimala, you know, there, there is this long corridor which separates the outer and the inner world. And uh, Nikhilish actually holds her hand and takes her out. So her, uh, you know, her coming out into the world is actually uh, holding the hands of Nikhilish. And he says that you know you are free to believe what you want. You are free to support any cause you want. Only I don't support it. So you know he's a true liberal. 
So through the character of Shondeep and uh, Nikhilesh, what Tagore was trying to do, it's a very complex novel, I'm obviously simplifying it, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, Tagore, even as early as, uh, you know, uh, even before the First World War, actually, what he was trying to do is he was, uh, he was trying to highlight, you know, that one should not follow or, or think of the concept of nationalism in a very blind, narrow way, that there are nuances to it. And one should be aware of it. One should be, one should keep these things also in mind, you know. Uh, so, so he was a patriot and a, and a cosmopolitan. He was not a nationalist. And so, uh, since uh, there are many more questions we could and would want to ask you about Tagore, his ideas of East-West dialogue, about the mm. author of Ice Candy Man, see mm. that the time of this episode is not that. that extensive. Maybe for now, we skip questions. Which obstacles do you face in India in the current climate with this ambitious and very important inspiring museum project? Mm. What are the obstacles? political and, and otherwise, and what, what are the dangers or what are the, what is the, the daily reality of attempts in India at historical revisionism? And, and if I can also, if I can also, sure. to keep one more question after is that regarding to uh, your, 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 the one that your your book your novel uh, Granite Junction. If you can also talk about it afterwards after that question. <laughs> okay, I will. Yeah, that's um, Thank you. The thing is, uh, so you know, you know, ours is a citizen initiative. That is the first thing to keep in mind. So when you are a citizen initiative, you're a small initiative. You start small, you grow small, you take small, steady, difficult steps forward. This is something we have. We understand. This is something we accept, our team, like, you know. And what we have done is uh, we have done certain, uh, uh, so I just want to tell you of the things we've done, then you'll understand how, what is the challenges we face and what we are trying to do. So in the last two years, from August 2018 to August 2020, we've held several events. Uh, one was an inaugural event where we announced ourselves publicly and we got our, one of our great filmmakers, Gautam Ghosh, to come and speak to us about his family experience because he comes from a refugee family and one of his latest films, Shankuchi, it's the name of a bird actually, uh, which deals with the afterlives of partition. That film deals with the afterlives of partition. And then, and with his help, actually, we did one, one of our major events still date. It was last year. We did a four day commemoration of partition through films. We don't like calling it a fest because anything to do with partition could not, should not be called a festival, you know. So sorry, we had to, a, sorry to interrupt, um, uh, but can, can you briefly explain the concept of afterlives, like how this relates to the generational? Okay, so to, so for example, this this particular film, it is something I just mentioned also a little earlier. So yeah. this is this film is about a small uh, village schoolmaster on uh, in a in a village on the border of India and Bangladesh. His uh, uh, his uh, daughter gets. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact medical condition now, but there's a certain su sudden medical emergency, okay? And it so happens that going to Dhaka, uh, which is the national capital of Bangladesh, where the, actual, the, the, the condition that she has can only be properly, uh, you know, uh, uh, managed or uh, medicated in Dhaka, but that's too far away. So what they decide is they come over to Dhaka, which is just across the border in India, okay? And there they get, ultimately the child does not survive. And they actually have to forge their identity. They, uh, they sell themselves as, uh, as West Bengali Hindus and not Bangladeshi Muslims to expedite the process. Because it's, it's a question of, you know, there's a lot of legal things involved, right? And time was short. Yes. So in order to do that, so this was a wonderful film, you know. And uh, so basically uh, it... What it highlights is that, you know, how the partition story is unfolding even now in peculiar ways. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there is a recent, uh, a lot of made, uh, recent films have dealt with this, this thing, you know. One of my favorites is a film called Marty, which was is the latest. It's 
it translates as soil. You could also say land. So it is about a girl, a third generation, uh, West Bengali uh, Hindu woman who is a history teacher. Her grandmother, uh, her family had come over during the riots in 1950, actually, not 1947. And what happened is they were a landlord in East Bengal. And uh, the story is that uh, the grandmother refused to come. The whole family came over. The grandmother refused to come because she just said, you know, this is my place. I'm not going to go to India. And then she was, uh, the rumor is, nobody knows how much it's true. The rumor is she was murdered by a Muslim tenant or by a Muslim, uh, not exactly tenant. Uh, he worked for the house, you know. Yes. And she goes, she, uh, a connection is made after many years when their neighbor's daughter, uh, granddaughter is getting married. So they get a marriage invitation, a wedding invitation. And she goes over for the first time. And she has this. She has inherited a diary. So this is this is really post memory. She has inherited a diary of the grandmother, and a lot of her life is you know she. The diary is so uh, meticulously maintained that she can almost see her grandmother's life. You know she knows everything about it. So when she goes there, she goes to visit that house, and that house is now owned by the grandson of the man who's who was supposed to have been murdered her grandmother. You understand? So, you know, they're, they're, the two grandchildren are meeting and the one owns the house, which was previously the others. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful, you know, their confrontation, they become friends and then there's a slight hint of a romance also between them at, at, at the last phase. But, you know, their confrontation brings up a lot of unsavory topics mm. about history, about what should be remembered, what forgotten. And so when she talks about, you know, what the family, what his family did to her grandmother also, he also comes, she also comes to know that this man's mother was, the other, hers was the other story. She was from Kolkata at a place which is a Muslim kind of a stronghold, park circus. It's almost a Muslim ghetto. Uh, so, you know, a, a lot of Muslims are concentrated as, as in that sense, uh, you know. So her, during the 1946 riots, uh, as I told you in Bengal, the partition riots happened much before. So in, uh, in the 1946 riot, the Great Calcutta Killing, as it's called, 16th August 1946, she had lost her entire family in the riot. So you know, so they, you know, they they try and compare the histories, and they realize that there is no end to this blame game. You know, who did more, who did less, and uh, so it. What basically, and he says, you know. Uh, the, uh, the East Bengal you are talking about through your grandmother's diary, it is not a fairy tale. Please remember it is history. You, you have a fairy tale. You have inherited a romanticized fairy tale narrative of East Bengal prior partition. That was not the case. And please understand that we have a very different reality in Bangladesh now. So they, they kind of come to a kind of compromise about how they are going to remember their family story. And I found this to be an extremely mature film because, you know, uh, violence was, it is, it is not about violence. It is about what happens, you know, how you deal with that generations down. And it's, and forgiveness is also a part of that. Like, you know, but it does not say that, it does not say forget. And just try and uh, try and formulate new ways of understanding our current reality. And Bengal is famous for its socialist tradition, hmm, hmm, the hmm, connection hmm. between the partition refugees and that socialist tradition. I remember reading a short story of yours years and years ago about a, a mother or an aunt who had to throw her dissertation into a fireplace because of her. She didn't have to throw it. It got destroyed. She didn't oh. have to throw it. Yeah, so uh, uh, actually I've not yet answered the previous question. Can I do that? I just just one oh, sure. more and then I'll come back. Is that uh, 
Yeah, so where was I? So basically, you know, in our with, with our project, what we are doing since I talked about film. So last year we did this four day. I'm I'm actually very happy and proud about this festival, about this commemoration, because what we did was we applied our vision to it immediately in our very first event. We were able to do that. So it was a four day. You know, Kolkata has seen a lot of partition film uh, like this, uh, centering around partition films, but never one which included it included documentaries and uh, uh, features from both sides. Of Bengal, and our uh, uh, guest of honor with two filmmakers from Bangladesh. One is a great Tanvir Mukammal, who has done like you know he has one of his his preoccupation is partition. He has done documentaries, features. I mean, all his work, all his filmmaking life. This is what he continues to do. Uh, so he and another younger filmmaker from Khan. They had come, and uh, then we also gave. The, we ended with a master class. You won't believe, the master class was sold out, and a substantial proportion of the master class was actually done by like uh, uh, the participation was from college students, undergraduates. So we think that you know this generation is not interested in history. My experience was very different last year. So we had this, and so that we could at all do it. Uh, so th this is the kind of things I said that we want to collaborate with Bangladesh. Uh, we want to involve the public where they will just not be passive recipients, but they will also participate. So we could do that. This year we have planned two events. One could happen. Uh, it could only happen. All of it could happen online. So I don't know whether you know about the 1947 Partition Archive. It has been initiated by Gunita Singh Bhalla. Uh, so she basically uh, it is a digital archive of oral histories, oral testimonies of partition. And she's been doing that, uh, like you know, tirelessly for ten years. So we had planned to bring her over and uh, to have an event around her. That could not happen, but uh, she invited me to one of our online events. So we kind of kept that dialogue going. The other thing we are doing is, you know, we have a website and a Facebook page right from the start. Usually, when museums have websites, once they are a little ahead in their journey, but we decided that we need to have a. Uh, uh, simultaneous online presence to let the world know what we're trying to do and to make it a part of our, our journey. And so what we're trying to do is we are trying to digitize and host in our website a very important uh, archive related to the partition of Bengal. So there was this scholar called Profullo Chakraborty who, uh, whose work has to do with refugee resettlement. And uh, his papers, the Profullo Chakraborty papers, were housed at IISG, International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam. Now we are getting that, digitizing that, from hosting on our website. There was an online workshop that we had in July. And this year, so every year, August, since August is the partition commemoration month, we want to concentrate on art. We want to do exhibitions and we want to concentrate on art in, in different ways. So last year it was films. This year we had four, five, five actually artists uh, uh, from Bengal uh, working on partition in very different mediums and very different ways. We were supposed to have a seven day exhibition at a very well-known uh, art gallery in Calcutta, Kolkata, but it could not happen. So what we did is we did a webinar where part of their works were shown because they were already working. Some of it was already done and not the entire thing. And we are hoping to have that exhibition next year. We have some other plans also related to art, you know. So the challenges we were talking about is challenges. See, initially when we started out, we thought we will any museum in the world, Arthur Row and Mohammad, any museum actually starts off as exhibition in some other museum. If you think of any major museum, you know, no museum starts with a place of its own. Nobody has that kind of money at the beginning. So initially what we were planning is we are going to hire space in an existing museum for one or two years and hold our, all our events there. But the way it panned out is we are having those events, but they are, they are taking place in different places as per the event. So the film happened, the, the commemoration of films happened in an academic space. Uh, it's, a, it's a museum and resource center. It's a very well-known museum and resource center, Jodhanath Babon. This one was at a very well-known uh, art gallery. So we do not have space yet, uh, but at least for some time, a year or two, for us, it is more important to have the events than have a particular space. So we may be traveling for a while within Kolkata itself. Uh, this is what we are, we are trying to negotiate. And the other is uh, we want to, we are a citizen initiator, so we definitely want collaboration, we want partners, but it's very important that we have the right kind of partners who understands our vision. 
because ours, as you have already understood by now, we have a diff very different take on how we want to memorialize our history. So people who are will be involved in it will have to understand and accept that and go, you know, we, we need to hold hands and go together, you know. Uh, so money is a problem. Money and space we still don't have. Uh, but, you know, the money, what is happening is, as you know, like we are going for separate events, we are going for separate funding. Like last year, we were funded, funded by a very, uh, like one of, one of the biggest private organizations in India who do a lot of philanthropic work. This year, we are uh, thinking of approaching a, basically an arts funding agency who usually fund art uh, exhibitions. Okay. Uh, so the challenge is that we... Uh, we need to keep doing this uh, with less manpower and less money. Uh, we actually we have uh, we have built a lot of uh, collaborations, like small uh, like small informal collaborations have happened, and we now have more people working for us. Like you know, till last year we didn't have students. Uh, we don't. This year we have student interns, twelve student interns. Uh, so you know they they are helping us in ways that we did not have last year. So we have. Okay ourselves capacity building is happening it's slow that is the thing and are you concerned or is the are the the, the staff in this museum concerned mm -hmm. that a, a change of political climate in bengal which is one of the more usually the more progressive provinces of india and has a mm -hmm. famous, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. are you concerned that there might be political counter force or political meddling or interference in such a project labeled as dissidents by the BJ, BJP or, yeah. or, uh, uh, Yes, you know, in in Bengal, what has happened is the okay, BJP is in power at the center. In Bengal, we have TMC, uh, Freedom of Congress, and they toppled the communist government, which, which was there here for decades. They are now in their second term. And actually, uh, the kind of landslide victory we had expected them to get in the last uh, elections did not happen. BJP has made very rapid strides in Bengal. And uh, next year, we have the assembly elections plus Bengal, where it will be a kind of fight to the finish between BJP and TMC. But you know, we as an organization are, uh, we are apolitical. For us, actually, uh, see, governments come and go, right? So the TMC may or might not, might not be there. The BJP may or might not come. We do not want to make that a criteria for our effort. We just want to proceed at our own pace, in our own time, with the vision we have in mind. So we are trying to steer clear of politics. Yes, you can understand, you can uh, say that, you know, for any huge project like a museum, how can you even think of, you know, the ultimate reality, the ultimate thing that we have in mind, how can you do that without statist intervention or the kind of funding that a, that a state government or a, uh, or the central government can give? Uh, valid question. Uh, but, you know, we are still figuring out how we want to do, how, what we want to do with this project. We are trying to figure out other models uh, where uh, state intervention will not be a necessity. And if we think that uh, at some future point that our uh, agendas match, maybe like, you know, right now we just want to proceed in our own way without, without reference to any political party or any government. Um, so maybe... And my final question, I'm saying today about your fiction, uh, Graya yeah. Junction. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you go take us through through the, the like yes. what motivated you to write it, and also like how the the, the trauma is being passed from generation to the second, and how the, like the, the receiver would react to it and deal with it. So not living in two different time zones where we're trying to live through the present. Yeah, actually, that ties in with the question Arturo was asking me about a particular story he had read about a thesis getting burned. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thing is, my, uh, my, my collection of short stories has nothing to do with partition. Yeah. Uh, it's a collection of short stories, nine stories, a slim volume, actually. Nine, you should read, by the way. Sure. <laughs> I yeah. invite you to read. Arturo has read parts of it. Uh, so um, it is uh, a collection of short stories of contemporary Indian women who are at a critical juncture in their lives. So in the main story, Goriha Junction, Kotha is a, is a lecturer. Uh, so she's going, uh, college lecturer, she, she's going back from her workplace to home. 
and she gets caught up in a traffic signal. Uh, now, what happens is she's meant to go back home, but she does not want to go home. Uh, more problematically, she not only does not want to go home, she also does not, she does not, she doesn't know where else to go. So she's at a crossroads. And uh, when the, uh, uh, we don't know how long she was at the junction, maybe 15, 20 minutes, could be 25, 30 minutes also. At times it was, we didn't have a bridge there then. So she could have got caught up for a long time. But in that time, we get a whole life. So she looks out the window and through a series of flashbacks, we get her life. So uh, we still don't know at the end of the story where she's going, where she's headed, but we get a glimpse into her life and mind. So what, what was happening to Kotha at Gorya Junction, like on a particular day in a particular place, the same thing uh, in the other stories is happening to other women. They are also standing at the crossroads. They don't know where to go. And it's written in different phases of their lives with women living out different roles daughter, mother, wife, single woman, uh, career woman, all kinds, actually. When I wrote, I didn't have any agenda. When I wrote, there were just certain sketches that I had in my mind. I was just filling them up, uh, filling out. Uh, fill, uh, but after a few stories, I realized that there was a certain pattern to it. Number one, the pattern was all the women are at a crossroads. Number two, all the women are either in Kolkata or from Kolkata. So there are some stories which are based outside, like there are three, one in Amsterdam, partly uh, more, partly in Amsterdam and New York um, and in uh, London, but they have a very vital connection to Kolkata. And, uh, and the overarching themes of the collection are really loneliness and unfulfillment failures. Because, you know, loneliness is a, uh, well, one of the great realities of life, uh, part of the human condition. And failures, you know, failures which are endemic to Indian society, but somehow get erased in this narrative of rising and shining India. And uh, as we were talking just a little while ago about misogyny in uh, um, in India, there are, uh, the way I see it, you know, uh, when it comes to women, we get two very contrasting realities in India. On the one hand, stories, horror stories about sexual abuse, uh, gender violence, inequality, which are true, real, it affects a great majority of the women population. Uh, but it's also sometimes sensationalized by the media. And on the other hand, you have huge role models, you know, women who live their dreams or mm -hmm. have dedicated their lives to others. But between these two poles, there is an ocean of stories. It's a chasm, if you will, of primarily mm -hmm. middle class women who are quietly drowning because their lives, are, since they are not dire enough, their stories are not dire enough. They don't oh. get told. Sorry, so, I'll, I'll take a, I'll, I'll ask one last question or remark to since we're over time anyway, but it'll be the last one. But maybe it's worth it. Uh, I remember one uh, particular story about the tragedy of, of, of inhibition and how this destroys the life of a, of, a, of a young woman who would seem very confident in her attractiveness and her life is very much destroyed by by her uh, inhibition and. and yes. And repression, which is something that some parts in, in some parts of the West it's become unimaginable, especially for for the new generation. But perhaps it also emphasizes the importance of uh, stories and literature. Because I once met a person from India who, with a straight face, tried to convince me that the cause of inhibition had something to do with centuries of Muslim rule. This was some person, very ideological explanation for basically for sexual inhibitions. And I, I think your story takes, of course, a very different angle on that in Garia. Yeah, so uh, I'll just quickly talk about the two stories you mentioned. Uh, so the thing is, you know, I, it, it is about failures and unfulfillments. Uh, so uh, one of the stories deals with sexual unfulfillment. So it is really a uh, woman fantasizing. It's a very short story. It took me a long time to write because I had to overcome my own inhibitions to write it actually. And I didn't give her a name because for me, she's every woman. I know a lot of women uh, who lead very unfulfilled lives sexually and uh, frankly speaking, don't have the scope to, um, to do anything about it. You know, So all those women kind of coalesced into this one girl for me, this one woman for me. And I purposely kept her unnamed because uh, she's really not any one individual. 
And the other story that I was talking about, as I was saying, you know, stories that don't get the attention of the world. Uh, so my mother's story was one of them. So her PhD thesis actually got burned accidentally. It's a, it's a very painful and it happened during the Nokshal movement in Bengal, the original Nokshal. Uh, so it was a kind of peasant uprising that started in a village and then spread to the city. And Kolkata got caught up in it. There was a lot of violence then. And people were pro naxal anti naxal and there was a lot of lot of police raids would happen in families which were sympathetic to the cause. And my father's family also, you know, uh, was uh, there was a, a police raid about to happen. This happened soon after their marriage. And my father, he had some what is called forbidden literature. You know, he uh, he one night he burned them all basically to save the family. It was done with a very Good purpose. Unfortunately, because he didn't know about my mother's thesis, the thesis, handwritten thesis, she just had, uh, the only the typing was left. The thesis got burned. Now, so this was something I came to know when I was in middle school and I didn't know what a PhD was. I just knew that something precious was lost and it was never referred to again later. But once I started doing my PhD, like much later, did I understand the pain of that loss? You know, and other questions came to my mind. Why did my father not know about that thesis? Why or not did he not know about it? You know, I know he didn't do it purposely, but you know, there's so many things that come at unravels. You know, then you know why she got married at the time she did, and why if she she. So there's so many other things that came out. You know, while I was trying to talk, and I it was very difficult thing to write because I was. I interviewed both my parents, my father and my mother, and they were in a different city than with my city, uh, with my sisters to call them up. And my father was very sweet, I must say. You know. He not only owned up, you know, uh, he, it was not his fault, really, I understand. Mm -hmm. But it was very difficult. And in fact, one other thing I want to talk about Goriha Junction is that all the stories are about women I know. Uh, one or two stories are autobiographical, but others are about women I know. So it was a very, um, you know, it was uh, for me, one reward was already there even before the book was out. These women trusted me with their stories, you know, and they uh, accepted my renditions of them. Talking about uh, trauma and memory and uh, the collection, my collection has nothing to do with partition, but mm -hmm. talking about transgenerational trauma, how I inherited my mother's pain and loss. You know, I have tried to archive pain and loss and silence in this if you, in, in seeing one way, I have tried to articulate many silences and and losses through these stories. Mm -hmm. And that is when for a long time I thought that my creative writing has nothing to do with my scholarly work as a partition scholar. Mm -hmm. And only recently I have realized that maybe there is a kind of alignment. I say a kind, I'm qualifying because it's not really direct. The, and the alignment is really that I, I want to archive. I'm an archivist, I archive memory. I want to archive the past and loss and silence. I think that. And, and Thank you that, very, very much for this interview. I, I think we, I mean, I think we are a little bit Way beyond time. Way beyond time, I think. And, uh, I'm so sorry, but uh, thank you for, thank you for giving me so much time and attention. No, thank and you. For our project, uh, most importantly, our project, you know, I do not, I do not miss any opportunity of talking about a project if I get it, because we are still very nascent. We need all the attention we can. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. It was a great uh, uh, episode in our series, and it fits perfectly with this whole concept of the cosmopolitan shipwrecks, which began with a, a midnight manifesto written by Mohammed. And <laughs> OK. We have a midnight story, you know that, right? India was, uh, you know, became independent in midnight. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Salman midnight Rushdie's is a very, novel. is a very important time. Yeah. Salman Rushdie's great novel, Midnight's Children, also. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Roy, okay. and Muhammad, and our technical uh, help from John Barrett from DMTV Local UK. Thank you.